Hello and welcome to your lecture for week 8 on um, contemporary art and in particular for week 8 we're going to be looking at the black arts movement of the, the really starts in the 1960s becomes a real um, cult, cultural force in the 1960s just as we see in the 60s and 70s the emergence of the feminist art movement and as many of you who wrote the queer theory paper are aware also the gay liberation movement uh, lots of movements that were centered on recognizing identities that were not white male identities and making them uh, part of the cultural mainstream uh, a process that has been going on for a long time and you know has become I think maybe for people who are um, of the the up-and-coming generation don't have any memory of of it being a, a, in any other way that you know we have a sort of multicultural society but that wasn't always the case you know the dominant images in media um, the people who had positions of power um, all of that was really really kind of um, uh, I would say homogenous and it's really in this period of the 50s with the civil rights movement and the 1960s with these other identity movements also although we won't be talking about it of course the American Indian movement that there's a real push for a change in the culture and uh, what I want to show you today is a little bit about the emergence of a kind of um, art world version of this among black artists so that's what we'll be looking at for this lecture and I did want to orient you a little bit to the history of this time period, more broadly speaking, just to give you a sense of the kind of momentum for change that was going on by the time of the 1960s and the 1970s with the black arts movement. More generally, of course, you have the very active civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s where um, African Americans, especially in the South but also in the North, were really agitating for political change to an end to discriminatory laws and practices in America. Um, this was famously, of course, led by a couple of very prominent leaders. We remember quite most, uh, mostly we remember Martin Luther King Jr., who was um, assassinated in 1968. Martin Luther King Jr., who was famous for his advocation of nonviolent resistance to unfair laws, um, for organizing marches, for organizing sit-ins at lunch counters that, or um, boycotts of buses that would discriminate against um, black riders. Uh, famously, he led a march in Selma, Alabama in 1965, images of which were aired on television and really kind of galvanized the nation to realize that there was a need for change. Um, when you saw police in Selma, Alabama actually sicking police dogs on little children, um, who were simply marching for um, civil rights. Okay. Uh, also, there was two, really two strains of the civil rights movement, one that advocated peaceful, nonviolent resistance like Martin Luther King Jr., and then a more, I would say, maybe um, a proactive or a more militant stance on the part of people like Malcolm X. Malcolm X, who said, and you have to put this in the context of the day when you have people being lynched um, on a fairly regular basis, uh, not just in southern towns, but also here in, in Indiana, um, for really for mob activity, would find a young black man and um, execute him, you know, um, extra legally. Uh, so Malcolm X said, you know, we have to meet violence with violence, and if we need to arm ourselves and claim our civil rights through violence, then so be it. Uh, Malcolm X also assassinated in the 1960s. I'm, I'm bringing these in because I want you to get a sense of the feeling of pressure and crisis that is building in the country and the, the, the very deep-seated need for change and for advocacy that is felt um, especially among African Americans at this time. In the later 1960s, you also have major race riots in the biggest cities in, in the country, including Detroit, Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago, and elsewhere as well, um, where people who whose neighborhoods were blighted, where people who were being um, unfairly targeted by police, where there's this just simmering tension that boils up in the summers of 67 and 68. In 1968, it's also the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, which was the scene of a lot of um, a lot of 
covert underground political activity as well as the you know above ground political activity of the convention. There were things like Abby Hoffman trying to um, disrupt the convention. There were um, there there was just a sense in the late '60s of a, a deep burning need for change in America, and that is where you're going to see the Black Arts Movement emerging. Uh, let's see, and I've just mentioned these, so I'm not going to go into these too much, but I do have a reading on the website I've wanted you to do. This is this um, first exhibit of black artists in uh, a major New York museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts, Harlem on My Mind, 1969 exhibition, which became the flashpoint for a group of artists in New York to say, we really need to do something. And in fact, they organized a group called the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, BECC, which was a group of working professional artists who said, you know, the problem with the Metropolitan Museum of Art exhibit, as you will know from reading, is that it's not really an art exhibit. It is a sociological exhibit. It's pictures of Harlem by photographers. It's not actually art created by artists in Harlem. It's not a real exhibit. We're not being treated like artists the way that white artists are being treated. We're being treated as a kind of curiosity um, on exhibit in the Metropolitan. So there was a real sense of a need to change the way that, power, that that people in power in institutions understood or recognized or even realized that there was black art. So the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition advocated for stuff like having a black curator on the staffs at the major museums in New York, like the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, they also advocated for the creation of a museum that's still there, the Studio Museum of Harlem, which actually is a space that devotes itself to uh, exhibiting African American artists as artists, not as you know sociological curiosities. So this will be one of the things that is a driving kind of you know motivating force behind the creation of some of the artist groups that uh, are, emerge in the 1960s and 70s. The one that we're going to look at is a particular group, and some of the, these folks are still around. Unfortunately, I mean as time has moved on, some of these the the original members of Afrocobra have passed away in the past few years, but Afrocobra is one of the groups that emerged from this uh, scene, and that's what we'll be talking about, and I wanted to just show you some images today. Before we get to Afrocobra, I just wanted to show you um, the kind of, you know, stuff that's going on working artists in the 1940s before um, and 50s before the emergence of BECC and Cobra and Afrocobra and all of that. Norman Lewis was actually an abstract expressionist painter who worked and exhibited with people like Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning, with whom he was friends. Uh, the thing about Norman Lewis and the experience that he had that was fairly unfortunately typical for African American artists was he actually told the story of being at an opening of uh, abstract expressionist paintings of which one of his paintings was on exhibit and being mistaken for the gallery staff and being handed an empty drink glass to take away. Uh, and this is, you know, it seems like a small incident, but it's the kind of thing that is endemic in the culture of the time. The assumption that a black person in a gallery is not there as an artist, but is there because they're part of the cleanup staff. Uh, and in fact, much like with women artists who were part of the abstract expressionist circle who found that, you know, they could apply for jobs with their MFAs as teachers in college, but they couldn't get them, although their husbands could, um, the same kind of thing happened to African-American artists. They couldn't... Norman Lewis actually ended up founding a um, program at the Y in Harlem where he taught young people in Harlem um, art, but even though he had an MFA degree, he wasn't able to find a, work, a job working as a professor, even though he was exhibiting with the abstract expressionists, even though he was p kind of a member of that circle. Um, there were certain institutional and cultural barriers that were in his way. So just showing you one of his paintings from the 1940s, and we have a couple of more. Now, Norman Lewis Unlike other abstract expressionists, as his career went on, he became more and more politically engaged. He was teaching kids in Harlem. He became part of one of the uh, predecessors of the BECC, a group called Spiral, that didn't exist for long, but was another kind of one of these attempts on the part of a group of, of African-American artists to create an advocacy group to organize exhibits and to promote black arts. Uh, so Norman Lewis's paintings also take a shift to a kind of more um, substance or subject-oriented um, 
approach than you would see with the more so than you would see with the other abstract expressionists. Case in point, this is his 1955 painting, which as you can see is still working in this abstract expressionist mode. It's not particularly representational. It's an, a large canvas. It's painted all over uh, with this tumbling sort of non-representational composition, but it has a title that suggests that there is a related social content here. Harlem Turns White from 1955. And then by the 1960s, we're getting even more into this mode. Here is his, again, it has some similarities to abstract expressionist paintings, as you can see, right? It's an all over large composition. It's very brushily painted. But as you're looking at it, I think you can probably see there are some things going on in this painting where he's referencing stuff that's happening in the larger world. And remember, he's working at a time and is conscious of the kinds of social things that are going on in the country. So Evening Rendezvous from 1962, if you look at it, first I hope you notice that the, the colors that are, emerge from that gray background are red, white, and blue. Second, I hope that you notice that the white figures, or the white splotches, the white areas of the canvas, resolve themselves into looking like they're um, wearing hats, like the, 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 the caps of the Ku Klux Klan, and carrying crosses. These are, of course, two of the major iconographies of the Ku Klux Klan, this extra-legal, I would call them terrorist group, that in the 19, well, really through the 20th century, particularly prominent in the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, 60s, uh, well, even more so in the 30s. But anyway, they, they one of the ways that they attempted to um, keep the so the status quo, keep the old social order with white people having power and black people being disenfranchised was to intimidate people, to threaten violence, to dress up in these white robes in the middle of the night, plant a cross on someone's lawn and light it on fire as a way to send a message of intimidation. So this is something that Norman Lewis is actually referencing in his painting. And then, of course, by making it a red, white, and blue painting, he's making some suggestions, perhaps formally here, with the ways in which racism perhaps is permeated through American society. So again, unlike other abstract expressionists who really remained uh, apart from politics, Norman Lewis, particularly in his later paintings, really becomes engaged in politics. And that will be one of the hallmarks of the black arts movement, is when you have pop artists doing things that look sort of formally similar, um, the, pop artists like Andy Warhol, on the, in the case of these artists of the black arts movement, they are going to be very specifically political in their content where pop artists might be, you know, like tongue in cheek and ironic. Um, okay, so let's see, here's another example. Here's a, um, from Spiral's one show in 1965, a show called Black and White in which all the paintings were done and all the images were supposed to be black and white. This is another one of the artists of the black arts movement, Reginald Gammon. Uh, his painting Freedom Now in shades of black and white, very much that kind of uh, a pop art style, a very graphic style, I would say, um, re reminiscent of something you might expect to see coming from Andy Warhol or a silkscreen artist or something like that. But here, what he's done has taken a newspaper image of a civil rights march and turned it into uh, an oil painting. So where you would have a Roy Lichtenstein taking a Sunday paper comic and turning that into an oil painting for, you know, and, and playing with boundaries of high and low. Here, Reginald Gammon is taking the same kind of source and putting it into a high art medium, but he's got a very explicitly engaged political reason for doing so. And here's just one of the many kinds of images that you could see in the papers at that time that Gammon would have taken as his, um, as his inspiration. Let's see, here's another one of the artists of this spiral group, Romery Bearden, um, who just died about 10 years ago. Romery Bearden, really, really important as an art historian for African American art, as well as a um, practitioner, as, a, as an artist. And this is his, um, one of his series, um, from or one of his images from the series called Prevalence of Ritual, and uh, this was in the Spiral Black and White show, where the subject matter that he's taking is specifically African American. So he drew inspiration from the streets of the city where he grew up, from knowing, um, um, well, from from 
from his background and um, putting the figures of people or the idea of um, figures of people that he would have known in collage form into these kinds of compositions. Uh, one more to show you by Romery Bearden. This is not from Spiral's Black and White show, but here, um, also just to show you, he's developing what, I mean, a lot of these artists of the 60s and 70s decide they're going to self-consciously develop an African-American aesthetic or an African aesthetic as opposed to the prevailing um, white aesthetic in galleries. So here's Romery Bearden's Three Folk Musicians from 1967, where he's working in this collage format where he would cut out um, it was a combination of, you know, cutting out newspaper and magazine images and using um, uh, oil paint. In this case, he's doing, uh, as you can see, three folk musicians wearing overalls and wearing uh, um, sort of country clothing, playing guitars and banjos, the banjo being a, a specifically African-American instrument, actually. Musicologists think that the banjo, the, the actual physical form of the banjo, comes from a West African musical instrument, and so that the history of the banjo is one of the memory of making these um, instruments, these stringed instruments in West Africa, comes across in the Middle Passage, and then when people of African origin are in the, um, in the colonies and then the United States, they have remembered how to make these instruments and this develops into the banjo. Anyway, well, I'm getting off track here. Three Folk Musicians is actually a riff off of a Picasso painting from the 1920s. He's using a similar composition, he's using similar colors, uh, using his own his own style though and the references to African American figures as opposed to these Harlequin figures used by Picasso. Um, so doing a kind of African American version of this modern classic and I have that on the next slide just to show you. So there's the three musicians from 1921 where Picasso has done this kind of um, synthetic cubist painting of three musicians playing the guitar, the violin, and the, um, the, the clarinet as opposed to Romery Bearden's guitars and banjos. Okay, well, that is uh, one of the, or a couple of the trends that we see developing in black art of the 1960s and 70s developing a self-consciously Africanized aesthetic, okay, uh, which is one strand of that, and also political engagement, political and cultural engagement to try to effect change in society. That all comes together in this group called the Organization of Black American Culture, which in 1967 started a public art project, a wall mural on a, uh, the side of a building in, on the south side of Chicago, not too far from, or actually, you know, in the same neighborhood where uh, Louis Farrakhan's ministry, uh, or his, his um, t Nation of Islam um, mosque is, this was not too far away from there, just so it's this sort of epicenter of um, an emerging black cultural nationalism that you've been reading about, hopefully, if you've been reading all the stuff I had posted in Blackboard, um, on the south side of Chicago. This mural includes figures like uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, Muhammad Ali, Thelonious Monk, um, high achievers in various fields, professions, and whatnot, in um, uh, various important figures in American culture that people walking by on the street could look up at and feel proud about and realize that these are people of great accomplishment and they look like me. So the Wall of Respect was a self-consciously um, political piece of art meant to raise consciousness, meant to instill a sense of pride, meant to um, drill into the brains of people on the street walking by that, you know, you can be more. All right, so meant to change the culture, meant to uplift society, uh, meant to proclaim to the world, not white as well as, as black, you know, these are significant achievers in American culture. So the Wall of Respect, an early example of this organization emerging in Chicago in the 1960s, the later 1960s, uh, kind of a, you know, corollary to the other kinds of agitation that are going on at the time. So Obeck's Wall of Respect in Chicago, 1967, 
Uh, I'm sorry to say this is no longer there. This building was actually torn down by order of uh, probably some some functionary in the city or the mayor's office or whatever in 1969. So this mural didn't stay up long, but it is a good kind of example of the very politically engaged public art that is part of the black arts movement. Another thing, of course, to note here is that, and in fact, some of the artists of this movement had, had even said this, they couldn't get their art in regular galleries, so if you couldn't get your art in a regular gallery, you might as well put it on the side of a building because then at least it will be seen by somebody, right? So here, this kind of inside the gallery, outside the gallery tension that we saw with the feminist art movement is something that's going on here as well. The organization of black American culture becomes, in 1969 or 70, Afro-Cobra. Uh, the Coalition of Bad Relevant Artists. Bad in this case means good. This is 1960s, 70s slang, sort of like fat became and sick recently have been um, slang terms for meaning something good. So Afro Cobra, the, uh, the Coalition of Bad Relevant Artists. Um, Cobra, there actually had been a Cobra in the 1920s in Europe, and so this is a reworking of that idea of a revolutionary society to affect change. And the manifesto is available on Blackboard. Um, key parts of the manifesto are talking about what we're going to do. What we want to do is to raise you know, consciousness to make people aware of being black, that, to embrace this idea that black is beautiful. And this is another 1960s movement that and actually goes back farther than that, but this idea of negritude, that, that black is beautiful, that becomes a key feature in Afrikober's art, celebrating the beauty of black Americans, black women. Uh, the manifesto also says we need to develop a black aesthetic and we need to develop one that has the maximum impact, maximum visual impact. And you'll see all of that when we look at Afro-Cobra art. Diaspora is just a word that refers to a group of people who come from one place but have been scattered around the globe. And in the 1960s, one of the things that people start talking about is this idea of an African diaspora. It is true that because of the transatlantic slave trade, you have people who are of African origins, maybe now many generations back, but not always, um, living all over the globe, particularly in North and South America, as well as on the continent of Africa. This movement in America um, to sort of towards black liberation, black cultural natu nationalism, black pride, happens to coincide with the last vestiges of colonialism in Africa in the 1960s. And what I mean by that is that in the, in the 1800s and early 1900s, Africa had been carved up and turned into basically colonies of European powers. In the 1960s, the very last of the European controllers of governments in African countries pulled out. And so there was this decolonization of Africa in the 1960s. So you have this sense of African peoples or peoples of African descent around the globe finally getting parity, finally getting control, finally being, uh, you know, out from under the chains of, um, of oppression. And so this pan-African idea is another thing that you see in the work of these artists of the 1960s. So we'll just take a look at some of this and um, just this should, you know, all jibe with things you've been reading. Now you can pause this slide if you want. I just uh, like this quote from Larry Neal's Black Art and Black Liberation, talking about what it is that the black arts movement has to do, right? We have to see ourselves in positive terms. We have to get our own artistic language. We have to draw on our own sources because white European sources denigrate us. You know, people don't portray Africans as beautiful. People don't portray us in a fair light. So we have to develop our own representation. So you can pause this to read it if you want. So uh, let's see a couple of examples uh, or a couple of things to know too. This J. Jarrell was um, married to Wadsworth Jarrell who was a member of Afro Cobra. J. Jarrell actually was a kind of fashion designer and here she is uh, she has created a, a 1960s um, new kind of um, uh, suit. I really like this. This is the revolutionary suit. If you look closely, you can see that the lapel of her jacket is actually a, a cartridge belt, an ammunition belt, that has been um, tacked onto this very kind of proper 1960s ladylike suit. So she has 
um, embrace this idea of, uh, of the militant, you know, black activism. Uh, another thing that's going on here is she's wearing what's called an afro, a natural hairstyle. Uh, that, that is, don't use any chemicals, don't use any straighteners, grow your hair out the way that God intended it, the way that nature intended it, that it is beautiful just as it is. It doesn't need to be straightened, it doesn't need to be tamed, it doesn't need to be, nothing has to be done to it. It is beautiful as it is. So the, um, and I don't know if people are aware of this anymore, but the Afro style on men and women in the 1960s and 70s was actually a very strong political statement about the idea of my hair is beautiful just as it is. It doesn't need to be corrected. It doesn't need to be changed. Um, and that, I mean, that was a very powerful statement. And this is another example along with, I mean, feminists believe this too, that the idea that the, the body and control of the body and who is allowed to determine what is acceptable or not acceptable, this is not just personal choice, it is political in nature. And that's sort of where Jay Durrell's revolutionary suit is going. Oh, sorry about that. Probably the most famous of these um, of these afros is worn here by Angela Davis, who's a, a University of California professor uh, who was associated with the Black Panthers and was arrested um, for revolutionary or, you know, subversive activity. Uh, she made the Afro famous, you know, this very beautiful woman wearing a natural Afro as opposed to having her hair chemically straightened. This was, a, again, a very, very big um, kind of political statement that she's making here. In Afro Cobra, this manifests itself in paintings like Jeff Donaldson's Wives of Shango, where you can see that he has taken J. Jarrell's revolutionary suit and turned that idea. Here you've got a couple of women wearing these um, cartridge belts. Everybody, ha all, they all have Afro hairstyles. And here, this is a, a painting that's meant to showcase and celebrate the idea of these women as beautiful and as revolutionary and as powerful. Here's uh, Ben Jones' black face and arm unit where he's taken the colors and the patterns that you would find in West African textiles and has applied them to these mannequins, these mannequin um, arms and faces, okay? Let's see, here's another example of an Afrocobra artist. This is another work by Jeff Donaldson. It's from a little later, but it again has the kind of Afrocobra aesthetic, the bright Kool-Aid colors, the patterns that suggest um, African textiles, the, um, the, the, the whole, uh, oh, and it's a reference to the idea of um, jazz music. You can see the keyboard there in the front and the figure um, with those gray fingers kind of coming out from the, the wave pattern or the, the um, herringbone pattern playing the piano. So this is meant to evoke the idea. And there's a, a singer to the right. Uh, you can just see that yellow line going off to the right there holding up the microphone. And then there's her face. And then you can see the bass player on the left-hand side. You can just make out those strings going up to the left. So it's a representation of jazz music, which again, African-American art form. Um, celebrating uh, and, and celebrating African music or African origins of music, Afri African aesthetic, bright Kool-Aid colors uh, in this large oil painting. Uh, back to the 1970s, here's a good example of the kind of um, Afro-Cobra aesthetic with the bright Kool-Aid colors, the simple word or the simple clear message here, Unite. This was actually, again, a wall mural meant to obviously be seen by lots and lots of people. And here you have the word unite repeated over and over through the background of the composition. You have the many figures in the foreground painted in a style that is reminiscent of pop art. But again, unlike pop art, which has this kind of ironic distance from its content, this is very purposefully meant to be an engaged and political piece. Uh, what these folks are doing is holding up one fist in the black power salute. So this is an idea, this is a, the idea of um, unifying the pan-African movement uh, and the idea of power. Here's another example from the 1970s of one of these wall murals. This is Unite Africa. 
and uh, by another one of these artists, Nelson Stevens. And here again, you've got the bright Kool-Aid colors. You've got the clear, simple message here. If you read the actual words on the wall, it says, work to unify African people. There is in the very center of the mural a map of Africa. The colors that are being used, green, yellow, black, and red, are the colors of the um, African National Congress. This is the political party that in South Africa was working to end apartheid in the 50s, 60s, and 70s and beyond. Okay, um, Those colors are associated with Pan-African unity as well. So the colors are specifically political. The message is political. Even if it has a pop art aesthetic to it, it is not pop art because it has this very specific political engagement. And then finally, I just wanted to show you this classic example from 1969 of the difference between pop art and um, black, the black arts movement of the 1960s. This is by an artist you may have run across as a, a children's book author in more recent years. This is her 1969 piece. Uh, it's a flag, and it was done for a flag show, actually, people's flag show. And you can just make out here, and I'm just going to warn you, I've got to use some un, um, unpleasant language here. Uh, when we get to the next slide. I think if you look carefully, you can probably see the word that's incorporated into the flag here. So let's look at the next slide. This is Faith Ringgold's Flag for the Moon from 1969. Remember, 1969 is the year of the moon landing um, when an American flag quite famously planted on the surface of the moon. Uh, here the subtitle is Die Nigger. Okay. What is Faith Ringgold saying in this painting, this oil painting, that, you know, this is what Jasper Johns had taken the flag and done lots of oil paintings of the flag, but clearly he wanted to, as he said, you know, it was a symbol that was so familiar, it was drained of all meaning, it meant nothing, and it became a vehicle for the sort of surface texture that he was working with. Ringgold has a very different agenda with Flag for the Moon. Uh, and what she seems to be suggesting is that racism is totally embedded into um, totally embedded into the culture, inseparable from the flag. It actually makes up the stripes and the stars of this flag, right? So a pretty strong political statement being made in this painting, a very strongly critical statement, critical of the United States. So uh, uh, polar opposites to Jasper Johns, basically. Uh, here's another example of the ways in which the black arts movement of the 1960s and 70s becomes very politically engaged. Here's Betty Sayre's Liberation of Aunt Jemima from 1972. And this is basically, it's like a little box that has um, a sculpture in it. Now, if you look carefully at it, you can see the back of the box has the smiling face of Aunt Jemima, this icon of um, popular culture, this icon of advertising. There in the middle, there is this very crudely caricatured figure of a, a, a mammy type, you know, very, very crudely um, drawn features of the, or crudely sculpted features of the face. And in her middle midsection, there is another kind of, this is actually early 20th century typical, um, you could buy postcards like this, you could see advertising like this of a black mammy holding a white baby, and then in front of her you have the black power fist. In one hand, Aunt Jemima, or this mammy figure, which is her ancestor, uh, is holding a broom. In her other hand, she's holding a shotgun. So the black power fist and the shotgun in, the, um, in this milieu with Aunt Jemima, suggesting that something is going to change, right? Here again, this is very different than the way that pop artists of the 1960s, white guys like Lichtenstein, would take advertisements and make them into oil paintings completely without any intent to, you know, change society. Uh, and really, they, somebody like Lichtenstein, although he was shocking to the gallery world at the time, looks kind of tame compared to Betty Sarah's liberation of Aunt Jemima, I think. Uh, here you've got her taking on advertising and pop culture and making a very different commentary on that. Uh, in case you're not familiar with this stuff, I've got on the next slide a couple of examples of images of Aunt Jemima that are the things that Betty Sayre is working against in this little image here. So let's see, there on the bottom you've got a creamer, um, a creamer and sugar bowl of, um, of these mammy figures that you might be able to find. 
uh, that were commonly sold, I'm telling you, across America. Um, they've now become collectibles, but they were commonly sold and commonly seen um, well into the 1960s and 70s. There on the right is Aunt Jemima pancake flour. This is an early example. Um, Aunt Jemima pancake flour was actually introduced in 1893, and that's an early example of a trade card advertising her. On the left is a 1940s ad, and here you can see that kind of um, caricatured language that is <laughs> in this mainstream ad that would have been in like Life magazine. Lazy folks show chia for fluffy, energizing Aunt Jemima pancakes. Again, this is stuff that was considered acceptable. This was stuff that people thought of as mainstream. This was stuff that, this is the typical representation of a black woman that um, had entered people's consciousness and was the kind of thing that Jeff Donaldson and Wives of Shango was working against, that uh, Angela Davis with her Afro was working against, that um, Betty Sayre is taking on directly in her liberation of Aunt Jemima. And here's another example. This is a male version of Aunt Jemima. So here's a 1940s ad for um, whiskey. And there's um, Toby, the loyal servant, you know, happy to wait hand and foot on his uh, white, em in this case, employer. But basically, this is, you know, redoing the whole plantation legend. This is the kind of thing that these artists in the 1960s and 70s are wanting to throw over. Here's another example. This is Murray DePillar's um, Aunt Jemima, Section 22 from 1968. A lot of these artists of the Black Arts Movement took on Aunt Jemima because Aunt Jemima was such a iconic figure in the American imagination, and this idea of the mammy was so iconic in the American imagination. So there you can see she's taking her um, pancake whisk, and she's getting ready to um, storm out. She's got her breast bared. Uh, this is a reference to Delacroix's... Um, um, image of, of liberty leading the people, you know. There she is getting ready to storm out of the Aunt Jemima pancake flower box and go kick some butt, right? So um, this is the, the, the basic kind of theme of the black arts movement that I want you to get is the difference between uh, or, or the, the political engagement of these artists in the issues of their time, especially issues that are concerning to the African American community. And then these are a couple of words that you should know, so you can pause on this slide if you need to to have uh, to make sure that you know what we're talking about here. Uh, I don't think I mentioned marginalization by name, but that's this idea that you know there's one there's one sort of standard norm of American, and that's sort of a white guy, and that anybody who doesn't fit that paradigm is on the margins, is not represented, is not part of um, regular culture. Okay. That's it, and uh, next time we'll be moving on into the 1980s.